this morning, a friend of mine, you know, posted something without posting anything about uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. It's incredibly hurtful. It's incredibly hurtful, particularly to people that I considered friends. While I would otherwise love to read your favorite banana bread recipe, it is necessary for me to, to have people, especially influencers, especially celebrities, to acknowledge that pain. Like if you were standing in a fire, you're in pain, and you have someone who's sitting three feet away who's not on fire, who's refusing to acknowledge your pain, and is twirling around with banana bread, it's the same thing. If something extremely personal happens to you, I wouldn't be able to post about Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and then in the midst of that, I'm posting about things that are lighthearted and happy and completely unrelated. White silence is incredibly powerful. It's not neutral. It acts like a weapon. It's not even silent, like it, it speaks volumes, right? And the people of color who are around a silent white person, um, they hear the silence and they feel what it means. Whenever I see someone who's not a person of color on social media who is not posting anything at all, it reads as either tone deaf or worse, being complicit. I'm watching who speaks out. And I'm not saying that you have to speak out and have this, you know, this whole spiel of Black Lives Matter. I'm not even necessarily saying I need you to post, but at the bare minimum, a friend would reach out to another friend. How are you doing during this time? I, I'll admit that I've been silent. I'll admit that I've ignored some of the issues that you face as a Black person, but I want you to know that I'm your friend and I see you and I hear you. I am paying attention to friends that aren't doing that. I'm a new mother, and this has been uh, particularly difficult and painful. So I look at my son and I see Tamir Rice. I look at my son and I see Trayvon Martin. When I see people choosing, because they have the privilege to choose, to ignore our pain, and our fear, and the fact that it feels like half the time we are screaming into a void, and that people are not listening because it makes them uncomfortable. When I see that, I want to show them a picture of my happy child and say, George Floyd was that child. Tamir Rice was that child, et cetera, et cetera. Breonna Taylor was that child. That is someone's child. And so the very least you can do is acknowledge the pain. The very least you can do is hear us. All the incidents we have had with Black people dying, there have been other officers, other white people standing at the sides watching it happen. Why? Why couldn't they have just said, stop, man, stop? Why was that so hard? You know, one has to ask whether there isn't a certain amount of, of willful blindness that comes into play at certain times um, when, you're, when you're talking about persistent white silence in the face of so many invitations to speak. I think fear drives everything or prevents everything. People are afraid of saying the wrong thing. People are afraid of how they're going to appear. People are afraid of their lack of knowledge and people are afraid of the unknown. I'm starting to see a lot of people say, I haven't spoken out because I didn't know what to say. I haven't spoken out because I've been afraid. And I'm like, okay, no, yeah, like that ship has sailed. We, the month of May has been brutal for people of color with the instances that we're just seeing happen every week. We know it's happening, but it's on such a national platform. And it, it's, you shouldn't be afraid at this point. You should just do it just speak out. You should be so disturbed in the way that we are that you can't help yourself but speak out. We need white people to engage critically, honestly, repeatedly, thoroughly in the dismantling of racial hierarchy and white supremacy in this country uh, because they're part of it. As with any problem in society, um, we can't, we can't solve it without the participation of the people who um, 
even if they don't want to be, are largely responsible for creating and maintaining it. In every society, there's a social caste system. And white people in this one are at the top. And historically, if you look at even looking at the civil rights movement, Black people have never been able to do it alone and by themselves. And that's partly because we aren't looked at the same way in this society. We aren't on the same level. You know, if we're screaming Black Lives Matter, it's because you haven't been valuing our lives in the same way that you do your own. So if you're not valuing us, then how do you value our voice and our opinions and our demands for our rights? That is why we need the assistance of our non-Black brothers and sisters to help us in this fight, to show that we are America, we are unified, and we are all fighting for equality in the same way. Look at us all as one. Look at us as the same. Look at us using one voice to fight for change. Find the action that fuels you. If that means there's a protest today at 3 o'clock, I'm going in Times Square, if that means getting up and protesting, if that means donating, if that means speaking in your own words on your Instagram, your Twitter, your Facebook, your outlet, your ways of mass communication, then do it. Stop hesitating. Stop thinking that you'll get it wrong. There is no getting it wrong. Michelle Sahin joins us now. Uh, Michelle, you are the co-founder of the movement From Privilege to Progress. Um, So I want to ask you, when you hear the phrase white silence, what does it mean to you? White silence um, is the option to not speak about the racial inequalities that are going on all around you. Um, I grew up in a white town. My parents are from Africa, they're from Ghana. And, you know, I grew up in a white town. I had all white friends growing up and um, their white silence was deafening. The white silence was actually oppressive for me to talk about what was happening to me in that town, the racism that I experienced. Because when you're silent, it sounds like you don't care. Um, Silence sounds like apathy. Silence is... Um, the the privilege of not having to address something because it doesn't impact you personally. So let's talk about uh, the topic of white privilege. Uh, When discussing racial inequality, uh, that topic comes up and it can sometimes derail the conversation and people may become defensive about it uh, because sometimes, not in all times, but in uh, oftentimes there is a misunderstanding around that term and what it means, just as there is a misunderstanding of what uh, of what Black Lives Matter means. When you get somebody who says, no, but all lives matter, you, you sort of want to gently say you're missing the point of what's being discussed here. So how can uh, folks overcome the defensive mindset to allow a constructive dialogue? You know, I wish that we could somehow try to find a different phrase for white privilege, because I think the word privilege is what really triggers people. They say, I've had a hard life, I've had struggle, I've worked for everything that I have. And white privilege is actually a very, very simple term to understand. It just means that your race has not impacted your life negatively. That's all that it means. It just means that any struggle that you have had, while absolutely valid, has not been because of your race. Um, Black people in America, uh, I mean, again, they were from from enslavement to lynchings, Jim Crow, segregation, mass incarceration, all of those things have impacted black lives negatively and not white lives. So if you can move through the world and not have to think about how you interact with the police, not have to think about those 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 crucial things that impact us, that's what white privilege is. And here at From Privilege to Progress, we actually think that's a powerful thing. Your privilege can move society forward at a speed and a rate that we need to see happening. Your privilege is actually a very powerful thing for progress in our world today. Um, If if it were up to people that looked like me, we would already have equality. So that is why we need to all come together and recognize that this is our, our fight and our freedoms are intertwined. 
I, I love the way that you frame that because it's 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 human nature, right? And I, I, I like that you talk specifically about the language that we use and that word privilege, which can be triggering for a lot of people. I know, and I think, and Marie, I, I told you about this moment once when uh, I was told that I was exhibiting male privilege. And I was like, what is that, right? Uh, because I'm a, ma a person of color in this country and you know my life has not been easy and all, you know, and somebody pointed gently to what it was specifically that they were talking about about being a man um, in the world and what that means, right? Uh, and so I, I like, Michelle, that you, you, you say that the language sometimes that we use um, can be triggering for some people. The question, of course, is that uh, you try to move somebody away from that thinking and it becomes very, very difficult because people don't want to believe. It's hard for any human being to think that they are something that is perceived to be negative. Even you know, people who are busted for crime say, I didn't do it. <laughs> well, you know, Vlad, can I, can I springboard off of that, Michelle, before you answer? Because it did occur to me as I watched that video that I was, you know, taking it in um, based on my own journey. And yeah, I'm a journalist and I, you know, work very hard to be non-biased, but I'm still human. And I wondered how someone who was not a black female would have accepted the messages from those voices. Um, and so I posted the video on uh, two of my my sort of Facebook pages, the public one and kind of the private one, and ask people just to react without any crosstalk or argument. And this is what I heard from white people springboarding off of the concept of privilege, right? I heard sort of two strong messages. One, well, I've been told because I'm white that this is the time to be quiet and just listen. And the other thing that I heard was, I am an ally, but I don't like being told how to demonstrate that I am an ally. I resent being told that if I choose not to verbalize in a certain way, then I'm part of the problem. So uh, keeping in mind what you, when you talked about privilege, you know, what do people who say that need to know? I think people that say that need to know that allyship is not, it's not um, a destination. You can't just self-proclaim yourself an ally and feel as though there's no more work to do. This is a lifelong journey because the biases will still be creeping into our subconscious. Um, it's important to understand that, yes, we all have a sense of, of privilege somewhere in there. But um, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I, I agree to some degree um, that we should not necessarily tell people who are on the path to, to, towards anti-racism exactly how, how to do it. Um, but even that response is a little bit just a little bit defensive. They should be listening more, um, but this is also the time to be amplifying the voices of people of color. That is that is also showing an act of solidarity. That is also showing um, your allyship. Yes, be more quiet now in these moments and be reflective and listen um, and amplify our voices. That's exactly what Melissa and I did in Starbucks that day. I spoke up, I saw mm. what was happening. She amplified my voice to say, hey, listen to this black woman telling us what is going on. And the next thing we knew, that Starbucks story was heard around the world. So, I mean, th that example to us is so powerful to show that our voices together mean something. Um, maybe you don't have social media, so you can't post on social media. That is totally fine. But are you interrupting conversations in your real life? If someone makes a joke, are you taking it seriously and saying, hey, that's not okay with me? You know, someone doesn't wake up one day and decide that they are going to murder someone that looks like me. It happens because over time and over years, their jokes go unchecked. Their little comments here and there go unchecked over and over and over. And it reinforces that what they're saying is true and it escalates. So that is why it's so important for white people to be in conversation, not just with us, but with other white people to interrupt those moments and truly show your solidarity and be part of the solution. Use your privilege for progress. When Melissa and I do speaking engagements, actually there are things that we will have her say on stage that I won't say because we really want the white people in that crowd to really take it in and see someone that looks like them and try to resonate with that and try and and um, empathize with, with what she's saying because they look alike. And it's unfortunate that we have to do it that way, but it's effective. Hmm. It's, it, it, it's, such, it's so fascinating. And the, the flip side of that too, I think, uh, Michelle and Anne-Marie, is that um, oftentimes people will say 
uh, to black and brown people, people of color, minorities in this country, that they want you to specifically think about uh, protesting your oppression within certain parameters. And I thought it was fascinating that Emmanuel Acho, uh, who had a ver viral moment this week, uh, he's a former NFL player, uh, ESPN host, um, he said on CBS yesterday that by that very definition, you are signaling that there is oppression. When the oppressor tells the oppressed, this is how you should protest your oppression, well, there you go. And I find it remarkable that you have had moments like this, going back to the civil rights movement where presidents, Presidents Kennedy, Presidents Johnson, they wanted civil rights leaders to behave or act in, the, in a certain way. And they felt that by acting in the way that they wanted to, that they perhaps could achieve more when many civil rights leaders resisted the calls to protest in the way that white leaders demanded. And I find it remarkable because I don't recall, or in, in my historical readings, I haven't seen anything that says, you know, King George uh, called the colonists here in the, in the United States and sent the Pony Express and said, you know, when you're protesting and you're dumping tea and you're out there uh, protesting my authority over you, this is how you should do it. And maybe we can come to some agreement. This has been part of who we are as a culture and a country going back to the founding and the revolution of this country. And yet when it comes to black and brown people, uh, that's not allowed. It's fascinating. It's fascinating because I, that's that's a really good point that I, I don't, I'm not even sure if I thought about it. Um, in that same sentence, you are acknowledging our oppression. You do realize that there is an issue. Um, and okay, if you want us to do it in a certain way, are you doing that with us? Are you on the front lines, you know, protesting with us, saying your piece rather than just criticizing? Um, I try not to get into those conversations with people if I don't see you leading in your community um, to amplify our voices, then you're ju actually just trying to silence our voice um, and have a narrative that makes you feel comfortable because maybe whatever's being said is making you feel um, like you're a bad person or you're not, you're not doing enough and that makes people feel uncomfortable. So it's much easier to say, do it this way, but really what that's saying is you're making me feel uncomfortable. Michelle, I want to ask you about um, from, from Privilege to Progress, um, your organization. It came out of that incident that happened in a Starbucks here in Philadelphia where the police were called on two black men who were essentially just sitting. I live in Philadelphia. I, I've gone to and used to go to that Starbucks pretty regularly because I live there. Can we talk about why you formed the organization and, the, and sort of the concrete messages that you want people to uh, get from what you're doing? You know, it's interesting. Anyone that knew me from that time thinks that I, I the, the universe or someone sent me to that Starbucks because a couple months before I had been Googling how to become an activist. And um, when I went there that day and saw what happened, it it was triggering. I was scared that I was going to see an act of racial, or I'm sorry, uh, police brutality right in front of my eyes. The year before, I had visited my home country in Ghana and I had visited a slave dungeon. So when I came back here, I really started to educate myself about systemic racism and systemic oppression, um, and I just dove straight in. So when this happened, um, I wasn't thinking about it going viral. I just knew I, I knew I had to do something. So I stood up. I started yelling. I approached the cops. I asked the barista what was going on. Her and I had a little bit of, a, of an interaction. She didn't want to address it, didn't want to answer me. Um, and I didn't have even a Facebook or Twitter at the time. So I didn't know it had went viral for a couple of days until people were getting in touch with me. And I got a random text message saying, Melissa DePino wants to talk to you. And I was so relieved because I'm watching this unfold and I'm watching them censor the white voice. And I'm watching knowing that had I not said anything, no one would know what was going on. But fortunately, she was aware of that. I think it, it, it had to have been her. She's absolutely one of my best friends, right? She's one of my best friends. We got together and we realized a, a few days later that the world was talking about this. And we felt that we had a responsibility con to continue that conversation, to show people what racism actually looks like today. Because a lot of people go to Starbucks and a lot of people can imagine being having the cops caught on them for not buying a coffee. It is just unfathomable to them. So they realized, oh, well, maybe there are other things about racism that I'm missing. And there are. <laughs> so Melissa and I said, you know what? We have to keep the conversation going. We have to start an awareness campaign. It was very organic, but it was immediate. And um, after that, it's interesting because 
people started waking up and they started keeping their eyes and ears open. And the Starbucks was like that first video that you saw in a string of videos of white women calling the cops on people of color for just living their daily lives. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely believe that we started that national conversation to get people thinking critically, to get them to reflect on their own biases. Uh, we do speaking engagements now, we have social media campaigns, we have coffee lab conversations with people, how to, moder how to model these conversations about race, because people still you know, are, are a bit confused. We give out resources, things to read, things to watch, things, a uh, podcast to listen to. And um, it's something that it, it's unfortunate that it's still, you know, we're still, the conversation is still absolutely relevant today. You know, we just saw Amy Cooper, Amy Cooper and the barista in Starbucks, very similar actions, um, wielding whiteness yeah. as, a, as, um, as a weapon. Yeah. So we just want to keep uh, that Michelle, conversation going. I we could talk to you on and on, uh, but we're running out of time. The organization is from privilege uh, to progress. I encourage you to uh, Google, look for it, find out what they're doing. What we need is um, areas where we can speak reasonably uh, about what's happening in this country. And you guys are providing that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, if you want to learn more about the impact of white silence, you can check out an extended version of that clip that we played at the beginning of this conversation and read more stories. Just head to cbsnews.com slash white silence.